a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classics and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Greetings, listeners. We're back, once again, to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits, like the Dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are Lovecrafty and leaning. Weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, This is an exploration of the Cthulhu Mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, Season 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Relenting of Sarnidak, The Jest of the Gods, and The Dreams of the Prophet. From Time and the Gods by Lord Dunsany The Relenting of Sarnidac The lame boy Sarnidac tended sheep on a hill to the southward of the city. Sarnidac was a dwarf and greatly derided in the city, for the women said, It is very funny that Sarnidac is a dwarf, and they would point their fingers at him, saying, This is Sarnidac, he is a dwarf. Also, he is very lame. Once the doors of all the temples in the world swung open to the morning, and Sarnidac, with his sheep upon the hill, saw strange figures going down the white road, always southwards. All the morning he saw the dust rising above the strange figures, and always they went southward, right as far as the rim of the Nidun hills, where the white road could be seen no more. And the figures stooped and seemed to be larger than men, but all men seemed very large to Sarnidac, and he could not see clearly through the dust. And Sarnidac shouted to them as he hailed all people that passed down the long white road, and none of the figures looked to the left or to the right, and none of them turned to answer Sarnidac. But then few people ever answered him, because he was lame and a small dwarf. Still the figures went striding swiftly, stooping forward through the dust, till at last Sarnidac came running down his hill to watch them closer. As he came to the white road, the last of the figures passed him, and Sarnidac ran limping behind him down the road. For Sarnidac was weary of the city wherein all derided him, and when he saw these figures all hurrying away, he thought that they went perhaps to some other city beyond the hills over which the sun shone brighter, 
or where there was more food, for he was poor, even perhaps where people had not the custom of laughing at Sarnidac. So this procession of figures that stooped and seemed larger than men went southward down the road, and a lame dwarf hobbled behind them. Khamazan, now called the city of the last of temples, lies southward of the Nidun hills. This is the story of Pompeides, now chief prophet of the only temple in the world, and greatest of all the prophets that have been. On the slopes of Nidun I was seated once above Khamazan. There I saw figures in the morning striding through much dust along the road that leads across the world. Striding up the hill they came towards me, not with the gait of men, and soon the first one came to the crest of the hill, where the road dips to find the plains again, where lies Khamazan. And now I swear by all the gods that are gone, that this thing happened as I shall say it, and was surely so. When those that came striding up the hill came to its summit, they took not the road that goes down into the plains, nor trod the dust any longer, but went straight on and upwards, striding as they strode before, as though the hill had not ended, nor the road dipped, and they strode as though they trod no yielding substance, yet they stepped upwards through the air. This the gods did, for they were not born men who strode that day so strangely away from earth. But I, when I saw this thing, when already three had passed me leaving earth, cried out before the fourth, Gods of my childhood, guardians of little homes, whither are ye going, leaving the round earth to swim alone and forgotten in so great a waste of sky? And one answered, Heresy apace shoots her fierce glare over the world, and men's faith grows dim and the gods go. Men shall make iron gods and gods of steel when the wind and the ivy meet within the shrines of the temples of the gods of old and I left that place as a man leaves fire by night, and going plainwards down the white road that the gods spurned, cried out to all that I passed to follow me, and so crying came to the city's gates, and there I shouted to all near the gates, From yonder hilltop the gods are leaving earth. Then I gathered many, and we all hastened to the hill to pray the gods to tarry, and there we cried out to the last of the departing gods, Gods of old prophecy and of men's hopes, leave not the earth, and all our worship shall hum about your ears as never it hath before, and off the sacrifice shall squeal upon your altars. And I said, Gods of still evenings and quiet nights, go not from earth, and leave not your carven shrines, and all men shall worship you still, for between us and yonder still blue spaces oft roam the thunder and the storms. There in his hiding lurks the dark eclipse, and there are stored all snows and hails and lightnings that shall vex the earth for a million years. Gods of our hope, how shall men's prayers, crying from empty shrines, pass through such terrible spaces? How shall they ever fare above the thunder and many storms, to whatever place the gods may go in that blue waste beyond? But the gods bent straight forward, and trampled through the sky, and looked not to the right, nor left, nor downwards, nor ever heeded my prayer. And one cried out, hoping yet to stay the gods, though nearly all were gone, saying, O gods, rob not the earth of the dim hush that hangs round all your temples. Bereave not all the world of old romance. Take not the glamour from the moonlight, nor tear the wonder out of the white mists in every land. For, O ye gods of the childhood of the world, when you have left the earth, you shall have taken the mystery from the sea, and all its glory from antiquity, and you shall have wrenched out hope from the dim future. There shall be no strange cries at night-time, half understood, nor songs in the twilight, and the whole of wonder shall have died with last year's flowers in the little gardens or hill slope. We'd like to thank you for listening to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Our sponsor is BunnySlippers.com, your finest source of wonderful Cthulhu slippers and cool, cool shirts from FoundItemClothing.com, your favorite shirts from your favorite cult films, and also 
these fine folks. Leaning south. For with the gods must go the enchantment of the plains, and all the magic of dark woods, and something shall be lacking from the quiet of early dawn. For it would scarce befit the gods to leave the earth and not take with them that which they had given it. Out beyond the still blue spaces ye will need the holiness of sunset for yourselves, and little sacred memories, and the thrill that is in stories told by firesides long ago. One strain of music, one song, one line of poetry, and one kiss, and a memory of one pool with rushes, and each one the best shall the gods take to whom the best belongs, when the gods go. Sing a lamentation, people of Khamazan, Sing a lamentation for all the children of earth at the feet of the departing gods. Sing a lamentation for the children of earth, who now must carry their prayers to empty shrines, and around empty shrines must rest at last. Then, when our prayers were ended and our tears shed, we beheld the last and smallest of the gods halted upon the hilltop. Twice he called to them, with a cry somewhat like the cry wherewith our shepherds hail their brethren, and long gazed after them, and then deigned to look no longer, and to tarry upon earth, and turn his eyes on men. Then a great shout went up, when we saw that our hopes were saved, and that there was still on earth a haven for our prayers. Smaller than men now seemed the figures that had loomed so big, as one behind the other, far over our heads, they still strode upwards. But the small god that had pitied the world came with us down the hill, still deigning to tread the road, though strangely, not as men tread, and into Khamazan. There we housed him in the palace of the king, for that was before the building of the temple of gold, and the king made sacrifice before him with his own hands, and he that had pitied the world did eat the flesh of the sacrifice. And the book of the knowledge of the gods in Khamazan tells how the small god that pitied the world told his prophets that his name was Sarnidak, and that he herded sheep, and that therefore he is called the shepherd god, and sheep are sacrificed upon his altars thrice a day, and the north, east, west, and the south are the four hurdles of Sarnidak, and the white clouds are his sheep. And the Book of the Knowledge of the Gods tells further how the day on which Pompeides found the gods shall be kept for ever as a fast until the evening, and called the Fast of the Departing. But in the evening shall a feast be held, which is named the Feast of the Relenting, for on that evening Sarnidak pitied the whole world and tarried. And the people of Khamazan all prayed to Sarnidak, and dreamt their dreams, and hoped their hopes, because their temple was not empty. Whether the gods that are departed be greater than Sarnidak, none know in Khamazan, but some believe that in their azure windows they have set lights, that lost prayers swarming upwards may come to them like moths, and at last find haven and light, far up above the evening and the stillness, where sit the gods. But Sarnidak wondered at the strange figures, at the people of Khamazan, and at the palace of the king, and the customs of the prophets, but wondered not more greatly at aught in Khamazan than he had wondered at the city which he had left. For Sarnidak, who had not known why men were unkind to him, thought that he had found at last the land for which the gods had let him hope where men should have the custom of being kind to Sarnidak. End of The Relenting of Sarnidak The Jest of the Gods Once the older gods had need of laughter, therefore they made the soul of a king, and set in it ambitions greater than kings should have, and lust for territories beyond the lust of other kings, and in this soul they set strength beyond the strength of others, and fierce desire for power, and a strong pride. Then the gods pointed earthward, and sent that soul into the fields of men, to live in the body of a slave. And the slave grew, and the pride and lust for power began to arise in his heart, and he wore shackles on his arms. 
Then in the fields of twilight the gods prepared to laugh. But the slave went down to the shore of the great sea, and cast his body away and the shackles that were upon it, and strode back to the fields of twilight, and stood up before the gods, and looked them in their faces. This thing the gods, when they had prepared to laugh, had not foreseen. Lust for power burnt strong in that king's soul, and there was all the strength and pride in it that the gods had placed therein. And he was too strong for the older gods. He whose body had borne the lashes of men could brook no longer the dominion of the gods, and standing before them he bade the gods to go. Up to their lips leapt all the anger of the older gods, being for the first time commanded. But the king's soul faced them still, and their anger died away, and they averted their eyes. Then their thrones became empty, and the fields of twilight bare, as the gods slunk far away. But the soul chose new companions. End of Jest of the Gods The Dreams of the Prophet 1. When the gods drave me forth to toil, and assailed me with thirst, and beat me down with hunger, then I prayed to the gods. When the gods smote the cities wherein I dwelt, and when their anger scorched me, and their eyes burnt, then did I praise the gods and offer sacrifice. But when I came again to my green land, and found that all was gone, and the old mysterious haunts wherein I prayed as a child were gone, and when the gods tore up the dust, and even the spider's web from the last remembered nook, then did I curse the gods, speaking it to their faces, saying, Gods of my prayers, gods of my sacrifice, because ye have forgotten the sacred places of my childhood, and they have therefore ceased to be, yet may I not forget. Because ye have done this thing, ye shall see cold altars, and shall lack both my fear and praise. I shall not wince at your lightnings, nor be awed when ye go by. Then looking seawards, I stood and cursed the gods, and at this moment there came to me one in the garb of a poet, who said, Curse not the gods. And I said to him, Wherefore should I not curse those that have stolen my sacred places in the night, and trodden down the gardens of my childhood? And he said, Come, and I will show thee. And I followed him to where two camels stood with their faces towards the desert. And we set out, and I travelled with him for a great space, he speaking never a word. And so we came at last to a waste valley hid in the desert's midst. And herein, like fallen moons, I saw vast ribs that stood up white out of the sand, higher than the hills of the desert. And here and there lay the enormous shapes of skulls, like the white marble domes of palaces built for tyrannous kings a long while since, by armies of driven slaves. Also there lay in the desert other bones, the bones of vast legs and arms, against which the desert, like a besieging sea, ever advanced and already had half drowned. And as I gazed in wonder at these colossal things, the poet said to me, The gods are dead. And I gazed long in silence, and I said, These fingers, that are now so dead and so very white and still, tore once the flowers in the gardens of my youth. But my companion said to me, I have brought thee here to ask of thee thy forgiveness of the gods, for I, being a poet, knew the gods, and would fain drive off the curses that hover above their bones, and bring them men's forgiveness as an offering at the last that the weeds and the ivy may cover their bones from the sun. And I said, They made remorse, with his fur grey like a rainy evening in the autumn, with many rending claws, and pain with his hot hands and lingering feet, and fear like a rat with two cold teeth, carved each out of the ice of either pole, and anger with the swift flight of the dragonfly in summer, having burning eyes. I will not forgive these gods. But the poet said, Canst thou be angry with these beautiful white bones? And I looked long at those curved and beautiful bones that were no longer able to hurt the smallest creature in all the worlds that they had made. 
and I thought long of the evil that they had done, and also of the good. But when I thought of their great hands coming red and wet from battles to make a primrose for a child to pick, then I forgave the gods. And a gentle rain came falling out of heaven and stilled the restless sand, and a soft green moss grew suddenly and covered the bones, till they looked like strange green hills, and I heard a cry and awoke, and found that I had dreamt, and looking out of my house into the street, I found that a flash of lightning had killed a child. Then I knew that the gods still lived. 2. I lay asleep in the poppy fields of the gods in the valley of Alderon, where the gods come by night to meet together in council when the moon is low, and I dreamt that this was the secret. Fate and chance had played their game and ended, and all was over, all the hopes and tears, regrets, desires and sorrows, things that men wept for, and unremembered things, and kingdoms, and little gardens, and the sea, and the worlds, and the moons, and the suns, and what remained was nothing, having neither colour nor sound. Then said fate to chance, let us play our old game again, and they played it again together, using the gods as pieces, as they had played it oft before, so that those things which have been shall all be again, and under the same bank in the same land a sudden glare of sing-light on the same spring day shall bring the same daffodil to bloom once more, and the same child shall pick it, and not regretted shall be the billion years that fell between, and the same old faces shall be seen again, yet not bereaved of their familiar haunts, and you and I shall in a garden meet again upon an afternoon in summer, when the sun stands midway between his zenith and the sea, where we have met oft before. For fate and chance play but one game together, with every move the same, and they play it oft to while eternity away. The Journey of the King One day the king turned to the women that danced, and said to them, Dance no more and those that bore the wine in jeweled cups he sent away. The palace of King Ebalon was emptied of sound, of song, and there rose the voices of heralds crying in the streets to find the prophets of the land. Then went the dancers, the cup-bearer, and the singers down into the hard streets among the houses. Pattering leaves, silvern fountain, and summer lightning, the dancers whose feet the gods had not devised for stony ways, which had only danced for princes. And with them went the singer, Soul of the South, and the sweet singer, Dream of the Sea, whose voices the gods had attuned to the ears of kings. And old Istan, the cup-bearer, left his life's work in the palace to tread the common ways, he that had stood at the elbows of three kings of Zarkandu, and had watched his ancient vintage feeding their valor and mirth as the waters of Tondaris feed the green plains to the south. Ever he had stood grave among their jests, but his heart warmed itself solely by the fire of the mirth of kings. He too, with the singers and dancers, went out into the dark. And throughout the land the heralds sought out the prophets thereof. Then one evening, as King Ebalon sat alone within his palace, there were brought before him all who had repute for wisdom and who wrote the histories of the times to be. Then the king spake, saying, The king goeth upon a journey with many horses, yet riding upon none, when the pomp of travelling shall be heard in the streets, and the sound of the lute and the drum, and the name of the king. And I would know what princes and what people shall greet me on the other shore in the land to which I travel. Then fell a hush upon the prophets, for they murmured, All knowledge is with the king. Then said the king, Thou first, Saman, high prophet of the temple of gold in Azenorn, Answer, or thou shalt write no more the history of the times to be, but shalt toil with thy hand to make record of the little happenings of the days that were, as do the common men. Then said Saman, All knowledge is with the king. And when the pomp of travelling shall be heard in the streets, and the slow horses whereon the king rideth not go behind lute and drum, then, as the king well knoweth, thou shalt go down to the great white house of kings, 
and entering the portals where none are worthy to follow, shalt make obscience alone to all the elder kings of Zarkandu, whose bones are seated upon golden thrones, grasping their scepters still. Therein thou shalt go with robes and scepter through the marble porch, but thou shalt leave behind thee thy gleaming crown that others may wear it, and as the times go by, come in to swell the number of the thirty kings that sit in the great white house on golden thrones. There is one doorway in the great white house, and it stands wide with marble portals yawning for kings. But when it shall receive thee, and thine obscience hath been made because of thine obligation to the thirty kings, thou shalt find at the back of the house an unknown door through which the soul of a king may just pass, and leaving thy bones upon a golden throne, thou shalt go unseen out of the great white house to tread the velvet spaces that lie among the worlds. Then, O king, it were well to travel fast and not to tarry about the houses of men, as do the souls of some who still bewail the sudden murder that sent them upon the journey before their time, and who, being yet both to go, linger in dark chambers all the night. These, setting forth to travel in the dawn, and traveling all the day, see earth behind them gleaming when an evening falls, and again are loth to leave its pleasant haunts, and come back again through dark woods and up into some old loved chamber, and ever tarry between home and flight, and find no rest. Thou wilt set forth at once, because the journey is far and lasts for many hours, but the hours on the velvet spaces are the hours of the gods, and we may not say what time such an hour may be if reckoned in mortal years. At last thou shalt come to a grey place, filled with mist, with grey shapes standing before it, which are altars, and on the altars rise small red flames from dying fires that scarce illumine the mist. And in the mist it is dark and cold, because the fires are low. These are the altars of the people's faiths, and the flames are the worship of men, and through the mist the gods of old go groping in the dark and in the cold. There thou shalt hear a voice cry feebly, Inyani, Inyani, Lord of the thunder, where art thou, for I cannot see? And a voice shall answer faintly in the cold, O maker of many worlds, I am here. And in that place the gods of old are nearly deaf, for the prayers of men grow few. They are nigh blind, because the fires burn low upon the altars of men's faiths, and they are very cold. And all about the place of mist there lies a moaning sea, which is called the Sea of Souls. And behind the place of mist are the dim shapes of mountains, and on the peak of one there glows a silvern light that shines in the moaning sea. And ever as the flames on the altars die before the gods of old, the light on the mountain increases, and the light shines over the mist, and never through it as the gods of old grow blind. It is said that the light on the mountain shall one day become a new god, who is not of the gods of old. There, O king, thou shalt enter the sea of souls, by the shore where the altars stand, which are covered in mist. In that sea are the souls of all that have ever lived on the worlds, and all that ever shall live, all freed from earth and flesh. And all the souls in that sea are aware of one another, but more than with hearing or sight, or by taste or touch or smell. And they all speak to each other, yet not with lips, with voices which need no sound. And over the sea lies music as winds or an ocean on earth. And there, unfettered by language, great thoughts set outward through the souls as on earth the currents go. Once did I dream that in a mist-built ship I sailed upon that sea, and heard the music that is not of instruments, and voices not from lips, and woke and found that I was upon the earth, and that the gods had lied to me in the night. Into this sea from fields of battle and cities come down the rivers of lives, and ever the gods have taken onyx cups, and far and wide into the worlds again have flung the souls out of the sea, that each soul may find a prison in the body of a man with five small windows closely bared, and each one shackled with forgetfulness. But all the while the light on the mountain grows, and none may say what work the god that shall be born of the silver light shall work on the sea of souls, when the gods of old are dead, and the sea is living still. 
and answer made the king. Thou that art a prophet of the gods of old, go back and see that those red flames burn more brightly on the altars in the mist, for the gods of old are easy and pleasant gods, and thou canst not say what toil shall vex our souls when the god of the light on the mountain shall stride along the shore where bleach the huge bones of the gods of old. And Saman answered, All knowledge is with the king. End of part one. Part two. Then the king called to Ineth, bidding him speak concerning the journey of the king. Ineth was the prophet that sat at the eastern gate of the temple of Gorindu. There Ineth prayed his prayers to all the passers-by, lest ever the god should go abroad, and one should pass him dressed in mortal guise. And men are pleased as they walk by that eastern gate, that Ineth should pray to them for fear that they be gods, so men bring gifts to Ineth in the eastern gate. And Ineth said, All knowledge is with the king. When a strange ship comes to anchor in the air outside thy chamber window, thou shalt leave thy well-kept garden, and it shall become a prey to the nights and days, and be covered again with grass. But going aboard, thou shalt set sail over the sea of time, and well shall the ship steer through the many worlds, and still sail on. If other ships shall pass thee on the way, and hail thee, saying, From what port thou shalt answer them? From earth. And if they ask thee, Whither bound? Then thou shalt answer, The end. Or thou shalt hail them, saying, From what port? And they shall answer, From the end, called also the beginning, and bound to earth. And thou shalt sail away, till like an old sorrow, dimly felt by happy men, the world shall gleam in the distance like one star, and as the star pales, thou shalt come to the shore of space, where eons rolling shorewards from time's sea shall lash up centuries to foam away in years. There lies the center garden of the gods, facing full seawards. All around lie songs that on earth were never sung, fair thoughts not heard among the worlds, dream pictures never seen that drifted over time without a home till at last the eons swept them onto the shores of space. And in the center garden of the gods blew many fancies. Therein, once some souls were playing where the gods walked up and down and to and fro, and a dream came in more beauteous than the rest on the crest of a wave of time, and one soul going downward to the shore clutched at the dream and caught it. Then over the dreams and stories and old songs that lay on the shore of space the hours came sweeping back, and the centuries caught that soul and swirled him with his dream far out to the sea of time, and the eons swept him earthwards and cast him into a palace with all the might of the sea and left him there with his dream. The child grew to a king and still clutched at his dream till the people wondered and laughed. Then, O king, thou didst cast thy dream back into the sea, and time drowned it, and men laughed no more. But thou didst forget that a certain sea beat on a distant shore, and that there was a garden, and therein souls. But at the end of the journey that thou shalt take, when thou comest to the shore of space again, thou shalt go up to the beach, and coming to a garden gate that stands in a garden wall, shalt remember these things again. For it stands where the hours assail, not above the beating of time, far up the shore, and nothing altereth there. So thou shalt go through the garden gate, and hear again the whispering of the souls when they talk low, where sing the voices of the gods. There with kindred souls thou shalt speak as thou didst of yore, and tell them what befell thee beyond the tides of time, and how they took thee and made of thee a king, so that thy soul found no rest. There in the center garden thou shalt sit at ease and watch the gods, all rainbow-clad, go up and down and to and fro on the paths of dreams and songs, and shalt not venture down to the cheerless sea. For that which a man loves most is not on this side of time, and all which drifts on its eons is a lure. All knowledge is with the king. Then said the king, Aye, there was a dream once, but time hath swept it away.
Thank you for listening to this episode of People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. I have been your sound editor, D.B. Spitzer. Check us out at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, pgttcm.threadless.com. How about, I don't know, uh, Facebook? Twitter? Instagram? YouTube? We are People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. And most social media, we're just PGTTCM. Thank you so much for listening, and join us again next week for some more Lord Dunsany. Unless this is episode reading 77, then hey, on to the next book.